Just making a thumbnail real quick for you all here. Hopefully that's not upside down, but it might be. So anyway, today we are here for why you should read Thomas Wolfe. Why everybody should read Thomas Wolfe. Uh, we got a huge stack of Wolfe novels here. And as you can see from the thumbnail or just from this, you know, screenshot right here, Wolf is a commitment, you know, you do not finish Thomas Wolf novels on a weekend, you know, you really have to uh, invest yourself. This is the only one I haven't read right here. And I was inspired to make this video because I just finished uh, The Web and the Rock by Thomas Wolf. I blew through this in about a month's time. It was uh, very, very good. As far as Thomas Wolf's uh, posthumous novels, his novels posted after he died, uh, this is probably my favorite in comparison to You Can't Go Home Again, which is actually quite good. And I think you're supposed to read uh, The Web and the Rock first, and then You Can't Go Home Again kind of is the final, uh, one of the final installments of Wolf. So maybe that's partly why I didn't enjoy this one as much initially is because it was maybe slightly out of context. I mean, you could really pick up any Wolf novel and read them as entities of their own, right? That's kind of how Thomas Wolfe functions, but you really want to start with um, what's known as Look Homeward Angel. Um, this is the first Wolf novel that I read. I found out about Thomas Wolfe from Jack Kerouac, actually, and they're vastly different writers, but if you read Jack Kerouac's first novel that was titled The Town and the City, you'll see where he was heavily influenced by our friend Thomas Wolfe. Now, when we're talking about Look, Homeward Angel, this was his debut novel, but it's actually come to light and was later published um, under the title O, o Lost, which was Thomas Wolfe's original title for his novel, his debut novel, and this not only is the title intact, but his initial version, which I believe is longer. I want to say, is that correct? How many pages is... Okay, so yeah, when we're talking about Look, Homeward Angel, it's about 500 pages versus O Lost, which is about 662 pages. Now, was O Lost, you know, maybe a little bit edited down? I'm not sure, but I can't wait to get into O Lost. Um, and I'll try to, you know, introduce this video in a, in a sort of a manner that is... Uh, conducive to people that are not familiar with Thomas Wolfe. So, which is kind of difficult. Here's a great picture of Thomas Wolfe, back cover of, of Time in the River. Um, now, you may have not have heard of Thomas Wolfe, and now we're not talking about Tom Wolfe, the sort of, you know, uh, you know, sensational fictional journalist author from like this 80s and the 90s, wrote Bonfire of the Vanities and all that. That's a different guy. I don't really know much about his writing. I'm sure he's a great cat and all that. But anyway, we're talking about the original Thomas Wolfe. Now, I don't know why somebody would have the audacity to take the name Tom Wolfe. Yes, it's spelt a little bit differently. It's not Thomas, it's Tom. Uh, Thomas is the original. But in my book, there's only one Thomas Wolfe. But if we have any Tom Wolfe fans out there, please let me know. He is also a successful author, but there's no relation or anything. And I'm actually bending the uh, cover there, which I don't like. So I'm going to try to, I'm just going to take a little piece of cloth and put it right here so I can read you this passage when the time comes. Uh, so let's get kind of back to the initial inspiration for this video. I've been attempting to, or at least planning, um, you know, contemplating a Thomas Wolfe video for quite some time. Uh, but I did want to get this as the final installment. Well, technically this is the final installment, The Hills Beyond, and we haven't actually read this yet. It's kind of a small novella. I'll tell you guys a little bit more about that. Um, but we'll start with The Web and the Rock. And now this is not where Thomas Wolfe's legacy starts. Like I said, the Thomas Wolfe legacy starts with Look Homeward Angel with his debut novel from 1929, I believe. Um, so we, I sort of, you know, mentioned that maybe some of you guys are familiar with Thomas Wolfe. Maybe you're not. Maybe his name has been kind of confused or overshadowed with Tom Wolfe. Uh, but another reason for the fact that maybe you haven't heard of him is he's not really promoted in the modern literary canon, the academic canon, perhaps. He was taken off the syllabus maybe in the 60s or 70s, perhaps, after the postmodernists kind of took over. 
because Thomas Wolfe is reflecting on and uh, writing about, um, you know, a part of the old American South that is kind of considered antiquated and perhaps, you know, non-politically correct, even racist. Yes, there's a lot of racist elements to Thomas Wolfe. Um, so I'm saying that objectively and open-mindedly, and I'm not saying that from sort of a, you know, the fact that I'm offended, you know, in sort of the postmodern sense that we need to censor, censor Thomas Wolf or he's bad. Um, quite the contrary. Um, I think it's a mistake to take somebody like Thomas Wolf off of the syllabus because um, what you get with Thomas Wolf is not only, you know, one of the best American authors that's ever lived, in my opinion, but what you get with Thomas Wolf is a very sprawling emotional intellectual and historical introspection and you know outrospection as well of american southern culture and also foreign culture thomas wolf was born in Asheville, north carolina in 1901 i believe might have been 1900 um, but he was raised in Asheville, north carolina at the turn of the century uh, went to a couple different colleges and then eventually taught at or went to Yale or taught at Yale or something um, and lived sort of his later life in New York City, Manhattan area, you know, where he met Elaine Bernstein, who became Esther Jack, who was one of the main uh, second protagonists, I guess you could say, in The Web and the Rock, as well as, you know, You Can't Go Home Again. And then he traveled to Europe. He traveled to, you know, uh, London. He went to France. He went to Italy. He went to Germany. And um, I would say that as far as Thomas Wolfe's novels is concerned, this is probably one of the most compelling, um, one of the most interesting, one of the most, you know, visceral and just one of the most epic and grandiose Thomas Wolfe novels that you'll ever embark upon. Um, and I think it's a little more, uh, as Thomas Wolfe said about his later novels, they're much more objective. They're more about more people can kind of relate to him, you know. Look Homeward Angel of Time and the River, those are his first two novels. He's very heavily influenced by his early life in Asheville and the American Old South of the 1900s, you know, leading up to the 1920s perhaps, before he went to college. And you'll get a lot of that stuff from these later novels as well, but you'll also get the European influence. You'll get, uh, you know, sort of the... Uh, the heightened characters all over the board, you know, for example, uh, a lot of people complain about, I mean, I haven't really seen that many people complain about Thomas Wolfe, but um, he's sort of like hush hush, you know, you, you, there's not really a lot of, um, despite the contrary, the fact that he was taken off the syllabus and the fact that he was, you know, he's considered sort of antiquated, I haven't really seen any a lot of Thomas Wolfe criticism, maybe perhaps you'd have to search the university archives for old articles or stuff and stuff like that. But as far as the main trajectory of blogs and articles and Wikipedia on Thomas Wolfe, most of it is fairly favorable. But for some reason, Thomas Wolfe is just not really mentioned. I don't see any YouTubers um, except for a few doing, you know, five or 15 minute reviews on Thomas Wolfe. Um, mostly it has to do with Look, Homeward Angel. That's his most famous novel. But um, this video is sort of designed to encourage everybody to read Thomas Wolfe. I think we all need to read Thomas Wolfe, um, not only to learn about ourselves. That's what we do first and foremost when you're approaching Thomas Wolfe. You will see an aspect of yourself in Thomas Wolfe or one of the other many, many characters. Or maybe you won't. You know, maybe you won't relate to Thomas Wolfe. Maybe he's too introspective. Maybe he's too, you know, grandiose. Maybe his sprawling, epic you know, wordsmith, beautiful prose is just too much for you. And yes, it's very, very overwhelming, um, but it's worth it. You know, and you can blow through a Thomas Wolfe novel fairly quickly. You know, if you just commit yourself and you get lost in these characters, you get lost in his descriptions. Thomas Wolfe has almost, a, you know, I made an annotation here somewhere. Um, his 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 writing it, you get these almost uh, visceral and almost over the top uh, uncomfortable almost disturbing descriptions of people and environments and thoughts and uh, you know landscapes and just feelings and 
all kinds of stuff. Wolf is uh, demands that you face yourself. Wolf, Thomas Wolf demands that you face your family heritage. He demands that you face your family history, your your life experience. He demands that you take on your relationships and analyze them. He demands that you take on your subconscious. He also demands that you take on your you know, daily activities, you know, what are your resentments? What are your fears? What are your anxieties? You know, it's not a real dry sort of sparse, you know, um, what's the underlying meaning like you would get with an Ernest Hemingway, what's the metaphor, or it's not a real cryptic, um, you know, sort of Shakespearean thing. It, it, everything is very, very laid out, um, you know, like you're about ready to eat dinner or breakfast. You know, he describes food phenomenally he describes you know men and women phenomenally he describes heartbreak he describes lust he describes frustration he describes you know what it's like to be in academia he describes the corruption of government he touches on racism and you know and obviously when we're talking about thomas wolf uh we do have to touch on the latent sort of naive racism uh you know thomas wolf was a product of his time you now he grew up in Asheville, North Carolina. And when you're reading Thomas Wolfe, you have to sort of, you know, not brush it under the rug, but you have to sort of, um, you know, take a step back and, and, and just throw yourself in Thomas Wolfe's perspective. Yeah, it might be a little offensive. It might be a little, you know, uh, vulgar and racist by today's standards, but that's the world Thomas Wolfe grew up in. Now, it, at the same time, Thomas Wolfe's um, ignorance or his potential racism, I use that word lightly because we're talking about the early 1900s in the South, right? So racism was not even really a concept. And I mean, it was, but it wasn't, you know, the uh, Thomas Wolfe and his family probably did not have a very firm understanding of the implications of racism, right? But at the same time, Thomas Wolfe's family, they were not slave owners. They were not wealthy. His mother came from you know, a very, very poor rural mountain community. Uh, his father, um, you know, his descendants were uh, Union soldiers, or not Union soldiers, I believe they were actually Confederate soldiers, yeah, especially if they're from North Carolina, I believe. I think they were Confederate soldiers, and his family derived from just the, you know, the untraceable, uh, you know, journey of human travel and um, sort of um, pilgrimage that was taking place during the early 1800s. His father became a stonemason um, and, you know, worked on gravestones and, a, you know, decor decorative pillars and, uh, you know, stuff that people would put in front of their house. He never really developed the craft of you know like a michelangelo which is what he was trying to do but um you know the title look homeward angel um, i think is a reference to another literary book but it also has to do with the soft stone smile of an angel that thomas wolf's father uh william gant um i believe his name is you know carved he, he was always trying to um you know achieve that perfection of the classical past and that's kind of where you get the metaphor for the angel uh, Thomas, you know, we see that on the cover of Old Lost and sort of that artistic pursuit from Thomas Wolfe's father. I think that's what we get in a very visceral and very um, sort of, you know, manic, uh, romantic, uh, obsessive will to be creative comes from Thomas Wolfe's father. Uh, Thomas Wolfe's mother, Eliza again, you guys can look, look, look up a picture of her on Google quite an interesting woman she was quite cute back in the day um back in the early 18 or late 1800s when she met uh william oliver gant thomas wolf's father but she was a bit of a stingy real estate person you know uh she was real focused on uh you know buying property she wanted to become a landlord and she ended up opening the uh old kentucky home um which is actually uh Dixieland in the novel he changed quite a bit you know just so people wouldn't recognize what he was talking about but that did not work for Thomas Wolfe everybody realized what he was talking about who he was talking about um I think I had a glass of water here somewhere let me go see if I can find it because I need my throat is getting dry
about that little intermission. Maybe you guys grab some water of your own or some tea, perhaps. Oh, that's better. Looks like there's a little dog taking a poop outside. And I do apologize for this, guys. That's an eyesore. <laughs> um, as you can see, I inserted this in the wrong direction. So this is supposed to be facing that way, so you can't see this ugly woodwork. So we will fix that by the time next video rolls around. So Thomas Wolfe's mother, Eliza Gant, was kind of this neurotic type of woman. You know, she was a, she wanted to, she wasn't really a real estate agent, but she bought up a lot of property in the old American Asheville. Asheville was kind of like maybe a mining town or just a sort of a, you know, a poor man's middle class town. Yeah, they probably had some wealthy folk out there. Um, and Tom, he met Thomas Wolfe's mother, Thomas Wolf, or he met Thomas Wolfe's um, father, William Oliver Gant. Uh, William basically came into, uh, she was selling books or something, I believe, or she was selling books door to door or something like that. And he came in, or she came into his um, masonry shop, or maybe maybe he came into her bookstore, I can't remember which. But anyway, she was kind of selling books or articles door to door or something like that, magazines perhaps. And obviously William Oliver Gant was the stone, the local stonemason. Everybody went to him. He had a pretty decent business. Um, he basically said that she was the most beautiful woman that he had ever seen and he really wanted to marry her. He needed somebody to take care of him, right? Uh, there's a really good lecture uh, from Tom Morier, uh, who works at the Thomas Wolfe um, Society Museum in Asheville, North Carolina, which is actually uh, the original old Kentucky home from Thomas Wolfe. That was the boarding house that his mother started. Now, she didn't start this immediately. She started this maybe when he was like five or six. He was taken out of his father's home. Uh, which he loved were from all his relatives and his mother Eliza his very crazy erotic overbearing mother um, whom he slept in the same bed with till he was about nine or ten years old yes very strange almost Freudian you know there's a lot of Freudian elements to Thomas Wolfe no evidence of any you know sexual abuse or anything like that but they were very you know close net he was snuggling his mother a little bit too late you know kind of like i was you know so i kind of relate to that it's just something that kind of happens overbearing mothers what can you do so maybe that's one reason i relate to thomas wolf but he was uh very you know his mother was neurotic she was over possessive right um now we don't really know too much about her other than that but she um took tom thomas baby thomas wolf to live with her at the old kentucky home and he claimed that he had no you know place of his own he had no room to his own he had no blanket of his own if it was cold at night he had to give his blanket and his pillow to one of the other boarders so what a strange way to grow up right kind of being uprooted like that i never suffered anything like that um i was uprooted in other ways from my parents you know um, separation and different spiritual elements you know being kind of alienated at school but at least i was in the same home you know for the majority of my early childhood adolescence i think that definitely helps a man or a woman to grow up with a sense of um you know foundation or a sense of family structure but thomas wolf did not have that his father still lived at the old house and his father started drinking his father was an alcoholic and we don't really know the extent of william oliver gantz you know alcoholic abuses or if he was just kind of a a, a reckless binge drinker but he, yes he was a binge drinker and he would kind of come to the old Kentucky home and curse all the boarders and curse his mother and curse everybody. You know, he was not happy with the fact that Thomas Wolfe's wife had kind of broken the family up. But at the same time, uh, you know, Eliza Gant was very stingy. She was not very emotionally, romantically dedicated to William Oliver Gant. That's kind of the impression that we get. So that kind of forms the you know, basis for the early Thomas Wolfe novels. You know, we got Look, Homer, and Angel, and we got Time in the River. And these are kind of, they're very related. Thomas Wolfe breaks away. It, 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 uh, time in the River takes place um, sort of around the same time, but kind of picks off where this left off. But there's it's still very, very heavily influenced by Thomas Wolfe's family. Um, and like we said, later in Thomas Wolfe's writing career, he breaks away from Asheville. He breaks away from you know, Eugene Gant, which was his character, his protagonist, uh, that symbolized him. Uh, we break away from Eliza Gant, who I think is, uh, what's her name in the novel? Uh, I can't remember here. It's right here, but 
Eliza. Okay, so yeah, uh, I might have mixed up her name, but anyway, yeah, Eliza Gant in the novel. Uh, her real name is uh, Julia Wolf in real life. So if I if I misspoke earlier, I apologize. Um, William Oliver Wolf, William Oliver Gant. For some reason, he decided to keep his mother's his mother's name different, but he ended up keeping his father's name pretty much the same, except for the. Uh, the last name he changed Wolf to Gant. Uh, so anyway, um, that's what Thomas Wolfe's early novels deal with: is his, um, you know, sort of growing up, metamorphosis, struggles, anxieties, tortures, joys, um, all you know. And there's a piece of everybody in here, especially if you're an American, um, and if you can get past sort of the antiquated cruelty of Thomas Wolfe's views on, you know, black Americans and stuff like that, um, you can definitely um, unlock the key to Thomas Wolfe and you can really, really find a lot of, you know, life advice. You can find solace. You can, you can mourn with Thomas Wolfe. You know, he pretty much encompasses um, a lot of my, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sort of, um, oh God, what's the word? Not esoteric, but um, what's the other word that starts with an E? The existential crisis of what it is to pretty much grow up and love your family and love your parents, but so slowly watching them age, watching your father go crazy, perhaps, um, you know, watching your siblings go astray or die. He loses his brother. And the last section of Look Homeward Angel is sort of a vision. It's a fantasy that he's talking to the ghost of his brother, Ben. Very creepy stuff, but his brother sort of comes back from the dead. Or this is Thomas Wolfe talking to his to his lost ghosts, kind of like I do in my life. You know, I talk to the dead family members, mostly through my writing. You know, I'm not sitting in my bed, you know, talking to ghosts. That would be pretty cool if I was, but I did get it out through my writing just as Thomas Wolfe does. And Thomas Wolfe gives voice to the deceased, and I think that's another re reason we should read Thomas Wolfe. But let's just kind of, you know, dissect that um, racism a little bit. Now, obviously, when we're dealing with Thomas Wolfe, we're talking about a very, um, you know, early version of, or, or late version, rather, of Reconstruction. You know, the Civil War ended in, what, 1860 or 1870 or so, maybe late 1860s. Um, so Thomas Wolfe's, you know, initial heritage that he can trace comes from about the 1870s all the way up until 1900 when he was born. And that's not really that much time, is it? So by the time we get to 1900s, Thomas Wolfe is still growing up in the very, very segregated, very, very racist South. And in Thomas Wolfe's early novels, pretty much all the black characters are basically background characters. You know, he describes them as, you know, kind of uh, blubbering, smelly, um, mumbling sort of goofy type of characters there is a little bit of ounce of humanity in them but but not too much they work for his mother his mother is very weary of the you know sort of the mammies that work for him and, and at the boarding house uh, we don't get a lot of racism from his father's side but most of the racism that we see comes from or prejudice I, I should say comes from Thomas Wolfe's mother and sort of Thomas Wolfe's own perception of the, you know, the black people that he lives around. Um, they don't have a lot of humanity, um, but there are some black, very, very sort of um, peripheral black characters. Um, you know, Thomas Wolfe gets a job and delivers papers out in Shantytown. So he's kind of reflecting on you know, the, the, the filth and the um, degradation that the black community is living in and old, um, you know, uh, Asheville, North Carolina. So you have that. But like I said, when we're talking about his later novels, uh, we get a different Thomas Wolfe. And this is why you guys should read Thomas Wolfe, because you'll see Thomas Wolfe change. You'll see him contradict himself. You'll see him um, enlightened. You'll see him um, progressing as a person. Um, now, when it comes to the racism, you have uh, a little bit of pr racism or prejudice against not only black Americans, but also the Jews. Thomas Wolfe is very suspicious of Jews, you know, for good reason. And I say that fairly and with all the love in the world. But I think Thomas Wolfe was aware that the Jews were kind of, you know, calling the shots and had a lot of financial and government sort of control. So you get, you get that in Thomas Wolfe. 
which I think is interesting. And Thomas Wolfe is one of the most honest writers. And I think that's why he's been taken off the syllabus. Is I think that's why a lot of people don't read him, because people do not want to be honest with themselves. They don't want to be honest about the roots of America. You know, it's easy enough to get upset about George Floyd, right? But, you know, for some reason, Thomas Wolfe is banned in colleges. And maybe if we read Thomas Wolfe, I don't know if he's actually banned, but maybe he's just not even a thought. But I think if we read Thomas Wolfe, we'll learn about why our society is messed up. We'll learn about racism. We'll learn about prejudice. You don't learn about something. You don't solve problems by shoving them under the rug. You investigate them. You know, just like we do history books. You know, we still read ancient Greek, you know, epics. We still read you know, the Declaration of Independence, or we still read Dostoevsky, or we read War and Peace, and so we can learn about things, and you will learn a tremendous amount about Thomas Wolfe. So when we're talking about sort of the prejudice or the peripheral black ethnic characters, that all changes with um, Thomas Wolfe's later novel, especially The Web and the Rock. Now, he still refers to black people with, you know, the N-word, sometimes Negro, so on and so forth. Um, he does not really speak extremely highly of them, but I believe that is a result of um, not only his naive innocence in the culture that he was living in, you know, he could not really get close to other cultures. You know, there, there were barriers, uh, not only through segregation, but also through fear and violence. Um, you know, there was violence from the government officials. There was violence from the poor communities. Um, on both sides. So Thomas Wolfe is sort of um, taking little bits and pieces and he kind of forms his own views of things. But uh, for example, in uh, The Web and the Rock, I told you guys a little bit about this character, Dick Prosner, who is sort of this old elderly black man. He was probably a descendant of a slave, I would assume. But he sort of works at the general store or something. He has this little old house, but he's real kind of fixated on his gun. He, he knows a lot about guns. He knows a lot about different things. And um, allegedly, Thomas Wolfe, uh, you know, some, at point, some he, maybe Thomas Wolfe invented this in order to get a little closer to some of his black people that he knew back then. But um, he sort of, um, the old black man sort of takes Thomas, you know, young Thomas Wolf and his friends under his wing and kind of teaches them about guns and tells them, you know, don't play around with guns. They're violent and stuff. And then towards the end of that chapter, a couple chapters later, Dick Prosner, the black guy, basically has a nervous breakdown from something. We never really learn exactly what happens, but he walks through the city, walks through the town um, out of Shantytown and just starts shooting everybody up. You know, he's kind of fed up with the law. He's probably fed up with segregation. He's probably fed up with his life in law. And Thomas Wolfe just brilliantly um, sort of immortalizes this character, whether he was real or not. But he touches on um, such a, he creates a wonderfully human character in Dick Prosner. And Dick Prosner, like, you don't want to mess with this guy. This guy is like, he's not the same blubbering, you know, sort of servant that we see in the old novels by Thomas Wolfe. We see a very strong, um, p strong and pissed off uh, character um, who's just kind of sort of takes revenge on everybody, almost like, you know, like we see today with all the crazy mass shooters. But it's a little bit different in this. But yeah, he is kind of a mass shooter, but he's kind of going after the law. He shoots up a bunch of the deputies. He starts shooting at the sheriff, all kinds of stuff. And he makes it all the way to the end. They can't really find him. It's like snowing on this very wintry, blizzardly night. I think eventually they do catch up with him. And there's also a passage. Um, I'm not sure where it is, but Thomas Wolfe talks about the horror and the cruelty of the lynch mobs. Um, that actually eventually tracked him down. Um, and so, you know, you have that. And he, Thomas Wolfe, um, you know, uh, sort of immortalizes Dick Prosner as a tiger. And tiger is sort of, the, 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 the name of the chapter is called The Child by Tiger. And the last, po I think one, there's a little poem at the end of the chapter that says, Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the force of the night. What immortal hand or eye could shape thy feral symmetry? What the hammer, what the chain, and what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? 
Um, he came from darkness. He came out of the heart of darkness, from the dark heart of the secret and undiscovered south. He came by night, just as he passed by night. He was night's child and partner, a token of the wonder and the mystery, the other side of man's dark soul, his nighttime partner and his nighttime foul, or foal rather, a symbol of those things that pass by darkness, darkness and still remain, of something still and waiting in the night that comes and passes and that will abide, a symbol of man's evil innocence and the token of his mystery, a projection of his own unfathomed quality, a friend, a brother, and a mortal enemy, an unknown demon, demon, our loving friend, our mortal enemy, two worlds together, a tiger, and a child. So, man, that just kind of, you know, you know, if that doesn't uh, make you think, um, what does? And he talks about social injustice, you know, and that's why... It's so foolish that we sort of have this modern, postmodern, you know, Marxist perception um, that everything is offensive. You know, these people back then, these early writers or these early politicians, they were trying to work through all that. And Thomas Wolf is willing to at least touch upon that stuff. He's willing to, you know, uh, dredge and, and dig into the depths of his soul and his society to get to the heart of this cruelty. And I think that's what's so great about Thomas Wolfe. Yeah, in the early novels, you might not get a whole lot of that. But by the time we get to Thomas Wolfe's posthumous works or the stuff he was working on at the time he died, um, you know, we have a great uh, scene from You Can't Go Home Again, I Can't Go Home Again, where there's this sort of greedy um, judge that sort of dabbles in a local... Um, finances and he's taking advantage of really really poor black people and he's making them sort of bribe um, their furniture basically they're in debt and he's taking advantage of them and Thomas Wolfe has this great series of chapters about how devilish this guy is that's taking advantage of all these poor people um, and he knows that these pe poor people from shantytown cannot pay their debts um, but he's sort of just making them pay um, whatever they have, maybe two or three cents every week or whatever. And he knows they'll never be able to pay off any of their loans, uh, but he pursues cruelly and, you know, devilishly into that um, enterprise because he's like the local judge, right? So we have Thomas Wolfe not only recognizing injustice, but we have Thomas Wolfe um, facing it head on. So how, how we can perceive or how we can, uh, why we ever took Thomas Wolfe out of the syllabus, you know, I guess I can kind of see it from a modern perception, but at the same time, I think it's foolish. Um, we read a lot of sort of postmodern garbage in school. I think we can learn a lot more from the books of Thomas Wolfe. You know, I mean, look how much, you know, depth Thomas Wolfe went in to examine not only himself, but also society as a whole. Um, and now, so those are sort of, sort of the you know, I don't know if I should say peripheral themes of Thomas Wolfe. You've got Thomas Wolfe's complicated upbringing. You've got sort of the, uh, you know, the very hot and desolate, poor South. You know, Thomas Wolfe's family was not rich. You know, they were not plantation owners. They weren't walking around on a fancy plantation. You know, they were kind of middle class, poor folks. So I think that's also what makes Thomas Wolfe interesting is that it's not like, um, it's not antebellum literature by any means. It's um, something much more visceral, something much more down to earth, much more um, post reconstruction, perhaps. It's not gone with the wind, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, it's not Toni Morrison, but it's somewhere maybe in the middle. Um, and just because a writer uh, maybe has not experienced the actual sufferings or injustices of some of the characters he's writing about, I think you can still get pretty close um, to those problems or to those solutions, perhaps, um, through, uh, you know, reading another writer or through the viewpoint of a person that is perhaps a little more better off. You know, sometimes people in their own misery don't even know they're being suppressed, right? That's why we have so many people in jail. That's why we have so many drug addicts and stuff like that. Because they know, but they don't really know how to perceive it. They don't know how to rationalize it. But somebody like Thomas Wolfe or perhaps John Steinbeck or any of those guys, 
you know, William Faulkner did a really nice job, but why Thomas Wolfe was sort of demonized, I think it's just because it's so visceral. People can just not handle it. But I do want to encourage you guys to start picking up some Thomas Wolfe. I definitely recommend starting with Look Homeward Angel, just so you can kind of get sort of, you know, the Thomas Wolfe Asheville universe under your belt, and you'll kind of have a good understanding. Um, and I do have to go back and read this. I'm not sure that his debut novel is really my favorite, but maybe it is. Um, Thomas Wolfe's debut novel is just very visceral. It's very creepy. It's very southern. It's very, very dark, and, but it's also very beautiful. Uh, but if you want to learn about the American South in the early 1900s, I don't think there's any other better writer that, that will do that for you other than Thomas Wolfe. Yes, it's cruel. It's brutal. It's shocking at times. Um, but that's what you need to know. You know, you have to know where you come from. You have to know the mistakes that people made. You have to know the mistakes that society made in order to, you know, it's like we said earlier, we don't just shove our problems under the rug. I mean, that's what I do. But in terms of society and stuff like that, it's so much better to um, open that door. Now, there is a little bit of anti-Semitism, perhaps, if that's a thing. Um, but I do believe Thomas Wolfe's publishers were you know, probably funded by Jewish people. So how did he get through that door? I'm not sure. Maybe it was because of Elaine Bernstein. She was Jewish. Uh, maybe she kind of introduced him to the right people and stuff. Or maybe prejudice was just much more acceptable back then. That's another possibility. Um, and sure, it's cruel. It's maybe uncouth. But it's, it's a man talking about what he thinks. You know, you can't argue with that. Um, you might not like it. You might think it's offensive. So anyway, but you know, we have Thomas Wolfe's early life. We have his neurotic mother. We have his alcoholic father. We have sort of his poor middle class life. He was ripped from his home. He's alienated. He's like six foot two by the time he's in the fifth grade or whatever. Very tall, gangly guy. You can sort of get that impression from, from this. He's got a protruding upper lip. He kind of walks around like this all the time. You know, you see his pictures. He's like... Just a very, very strange character, but he was always really nicely dressed, a bit shabby. He didn't really wash his clothes, didn't take a lot of baths. Kind of my kind of guy. Not that I would do that, but hell, that's pretty cool. Walking around in shabby, shabby old 1920s and 30s clothes. Um, smoked a lot of cigarettes, drank a lot. Um, read books, you know, like they were, like they were going out of style. Um, but, you know, so you have a lot of elements of Thomas Wolfe. Like, you know, like we've discussed, you have the emotional turmoil. You have the, the turmoil of growing up. You have the alienation. You have the family problems at home, which I can relate to all of that. And on top of that, you got the social restrictions. You got the social anxieties. You got the social problems, the racism, the government, the, you know, um, Asheville, North Carolina is a very weird town surrounded by mountains. Thomas Wolfe always saw the train kind of coming and going through the mist of the, of the mountains. And he was always trying to kind of come to terms with what lay beyond the bounds of his hometown. Where did that weird, you know, machine take people? You know, he's at the turn of the century, right? Um, they're just starting to come out with telephone poles and, cell, and, and um, you know, early telephones and Victrolas and, and you know, the... the uh, the railroad industry and all these changes, you know, Thomas Wolfe was almost witnessing the death of the old South um, as his forebears knew it, as his old family knew it. Um, now, when I initially started reading Thomas Wolfe, I didn't annotate properly. You know, I was just kind of reading. Um, I was reading deeply, but I wasn't really uh, being a reactive reader versus now. You can see um, I'm a very, very deep reactive reader trying to you know, really suck out the marrow of Thomas Wolfe. So we did have a slight interruption there. My phone just sent me an amber alert for a missing person in Newport News. I didn't realize that it was going to stop the video. Uh, but anyway, God bless. I hope they find that young person. Um, hopefully we'll be coming out with another sort of true crime video at some point um, to shed light on, you know, that's just another reminder to be aware of what's going on out there in society. So we have Thomas Wolfe's early life, right? So we've got all the emotional turmoil. We've got the epic, grandiose introspection. Uh, we've got society problems. We've got family problems. We've got this and that. So by the time we kind of get to, um, you know, the web and the rock, Thomas Wolfe has matured. He even changed his character to George Weber. His nickname is Monk. 
Um, and he, you know, it's sort of a, a, a different retelling of his early life. The first maybe quarter of the book is where we have Dick Prosner and we have Thomas Wolfe's father, um, his weird mother. And, and for some reason, Thomas Wolfe changed his protagonist to sort of like this orphan boy um, who, uh, you know, sort of was alienated from his upbringing because of the fact that he was an orphan and stuff like that um, but we do have sort of have different father figures in the web in the rock and we have thomas wolf's mother who is i forgot what her name is somebody joiner there's a family named joiners and that's who it might even be his grandmother on that side who adopted him or something so we have a lot of different sort of motherly characters we have masculine fatherly characters but they sort of come in different people other than his own kin and I think that's really interesting. By the time we get to a little under halfway, Thomas Wolfe, um, you know, he they didn't really explain too much of his college years. That's more of perhaps, and you can't go home again, and also of time in the river. You get a lot of Thomas Wolfe's, uh, you know, days at college and teaching at college and stuff um, and the stresses of it. Um, but by the time we get to Thomas Wolfe's later novels, you know, we have the... Um, exploration of different facets of American culture but also foreign culture and we have this beautiful section at the end of the novel uh, where Thomas Wolfe goes to Germany I forgot the name of the town um, but Thomas Wolfe is obsessed with October and he does this amazing um, theme that takes place at Oktoberfest when everybody's drinking beer eating tons of food and we have these extremely disturbing descriptions of Oktoberfest. I mean, it's very delightful. It's very wonderful. Ooh, just dropped my Thomas Wolfe book. But it's almost visceral. It's almost creepy. Thomas Wolfe talks about the tents with thousands of people rushing to get beer and everybody was dancing and singing drinking songs and eating food and they ate a huge ox that was spinning on a spit and he talks about sitting in the dark in tents and just watching everybody's strange faces and there's this beautiful character of this young woman that comes and talks to them and and uh and then by the end of the novel thomas wolf wakes up and, or, or george monk weber wakes up in a hospital and he's like beat to shit somebody beat the crap out of him he got into a fight at Oktoberfest because he was drinking so much he kind of lost track of what was going on right um and we have this wonderful, creepy, nostalgic, visceral introspection of Thomas Wolfe sitting in a, he's sitting beat up in his room or his hospital bed. He's just kind of like this, his face is all bandaged and whatnot. And he um, is looking at himself in the mirror and sees like this sort of vulgar, horrid, you know, version of himself. And he introspects and he kind of discovers why he, he realizes how he ended up like that because he's felt so estranged and he's tried to swallow the world. He's tried to drink as much as he could. He's tried to eat as much as he could. He's tried to read as much as he could. He's tried to meet so many people and travel and fall in love. And, and Thomas Wolfe has these wonderful, um, creepy descriptions of going to brothels and whorehouses in Germany and Europe. And we get the sense that Thomas Wolfe is disgusted with himself, but he's so enchanted by the nightlife and the prostitutes. And he kind of um, spends an evening with this old, mangly, demented prostitute. And it's just like, I, I don't even know where to start with Thomas Wolfe. It's just such a labyrinth of um, wonderful information and character analysis and human experience. Um, and hopefully I have inspired you guys to read Thomas Wolfe. Um, there's something else I want to touch upon is the way Thomas Wolfe's, um, I haven't read enough of Thomas Wolfe in this video like we, like we should, uh, but there is a wonderful passage here from Of Time in the River that stuck out to me, and I just happened to find it here before we started the video. Um, now this is when Thomas Wolfe is coming back from a visit from college to kind of check on his father. His father is falling ill. Um, so look, where shall we read this? Basically, in a nutshell, Thomas Wolfe goes to talk to his, his old mother here. His mother's aged quite a bit. He's a little bit estranged from her. Um, but let's just kind of read this passage here. Um, and we'll start right here. When he returned home, it was after midnight, and his mother mother's old house, uh, his mother's old gaunt house was dark. He went quickly up the steps and entered the broad front hallway, closing the heavy door quietly behind him. 
For a minute he stood there in that living dark, the ancient and breathing darkness of the old house which seemed to speak to him with all the thousands of voices of its vanished lives, with all the shapes and presence of things and people he had known who had been there and who had passed or vanished or had died. Then quietly he groped his way along the dark hallway and towards the kitchen and the little room beyond in which his mother slept. When he got to the kitchen, the room was dark, save for the soft flare and crumble of the fading ashes in the old coal range. But the kitchen was still warm, with a curious and recent currency of warmth and silence, as if it were still filled with his mother's life, and as if she had just been there. He turned on the light and for a minute stood looking at the familiar old table with its sheathing of ragged, battered zinc, at the ironing board with its great stack of freshly ironed and neatly folded linen, and he knew that she had worked there late. Suddenly, a desperate rush, an overmastering desire to seek her, speak to her, awoke in him. He thought that if he could only see her now, he could reveal himself to her, explain the purpose of his failure, the certainty of his success. He was trying to become a writer and stuff back then. He was sure that now, if ever, ever, he could speak to her and say the things he had always wished to say, but never said. Speak the unspeakable, find a tongue for the unspoken language, make her understand his life, his purpose, his heart's desire, as he had never done before. And filled with this hope, this impossible conviction, he strode towards the closed door of her little room to rouse her. Then abruptly he paused upon an old cup cupboard. And a glass half filled with water he saw, as he had seen a thousand times, grinning at him with a prognath prognathus, a strangely human bleakness, the false teeth she had put there when she went to bed. So his mother's lost all of her teeth now. And suddenly he knew he could not speak to her, for grotesque, ugly, and absurd as they were, those grinning teeth evolved for him somehow as nothing else on earth could do the whole image of his mother's life of grief and toil and labor the intolerable memories of the vanished and the irrevocable years the strange and bitter miracle of life and he knew then that he could not speak that there was nothing he could say to her he rapped gently on the door and in a moment heard her voice quick sharp and startled roused from sleep saying huh what say who's there he answered in a moment she opened the door and stood there her face startled curiously small and white and sunken somehow like a child when he spoke to her she answered incoherently and then she smiled in an apologetic and embarrassed manner and covered her mouth shyly with one hand while she extended her other for the glass that held her teeth he turned his head away when he looked again her face had taken on its familiar contour and she was saying in her usual tone huh what is it son nothing mama he said awkwardly i i i didn't know you were asleep i i i just came in to say good night mama good night son she said and turned her white cheek up to him he kissed it briefly now go and get some sleep she said it's late and you're you, you're all packed up to do when you get up tomorrow. It's late and you've all your packing to do when you get up tomorrow. I guess he's packing to leave to go back to college. Yes, he said awkwardly, I guess you're right. Well, good night, and he kissed her again. Good night, she said. Turn out the lights, won't you, before you go to bed? And as he turned the kitchen light out, he heard her door close quietly behind him and the dark and lonely silence of the old house was all around him as he went down the hall and a thousand voices, his father's, his brother's, and of the child that he himself had been, and all the lives and the voices of the hundred others, the lost, the vanished people, were whispering to him as he went down the old dark hall there in his mother's house, and the remote, demented wind was howling in the barren trees, as he had heard it do so many times in childhood, and far off, far faint and broken by the wind, he heard the wailing cry of the great train bringing to him again its wild and secret promises of flight and darkness, new lands and a shining city. And there was something wild and dark and sweet in him that he could never utter. 
The strange and bitter miracle of life had filled him, and he could not speak, and all he knew was that he was leaving home forever, that the world, the future of dark time and of man's destiny lay before him, and that he would never live here in his mother's house again. So, you know, that's that's what you get with Thomas Wolfe. There's no, uh, it's not Ernest Hemingway, that's for sure. It's a, it's a lot different aesthetic. Um, it's a different emotion. It's highly emotional. It's hyper analytical. It's hyper introspective. It's hyper philosophical. You know, there's there's nothing that Thomas Wolfe doesn't explore, pretty much. You know, like 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 any great writer does. You know, there's stuff that Hemingway does that Thomas Wolfe can't do, and vice versa. There's stuff that Shakespeare can do that Thomas Wolfe can't do. There's stuff that you know Charles Bukowski can do that Thomas Wolfe can't do. You know, there's stuff that Dostoevsky can do that Hemingway can't do. So, um, you know, you need to approach Thomas Wolfe with all of the, your life experience and also the other writers that you admire. Um, but try to find a flicker, try to find a passage in Thomas Wolfe through the sprawling, you know, uh, overwhelming life story and life experience that he's offering you. Try to find a secret to that unfound door that Thomas Wolfe was always looking for that soft stone smile of an angel um, you know that link to the distant past that you know that passage of him talking to his mother um, you know that reminds me of me and, and my mother when she became old um, and did that try to find the, 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 the words to that forgotten language to, to speak to your loved ones um, it's, it's very very elusive it's very very emotional I think you'll get that with Thomas Wolfe. So thank you so much for watching this video. I'm not sure how I'm going to structure this because my video is now split into two. Um, and I work primarily on my cell phone. So hopefully I can try to put the two clips together and upload it as one. But if not, we'll just have part one and part two. Probably upload them on the same day or two. Um, thank you so much for, for watching, guys. Make sure you guys like this video. Please subscribe and read some Thomas Wolfe.